Yes, it's 70 years since the formation of Britain's Home Guard, and they've been remembered at a special event at Osterley Park in Middlesex. The park was used as their training site, where the real Dad's Army learned guerrilla warfare tactics and the art of making explosives. The parks played host to a weekend of reenactments and an archaeological dig to see what the Home Guard left behind. Victoria Smith was there. In June of 1940, 300,000 volunteers signed up to Britain's newly formed Home Fighting Force. 70 years on, their legacy has been brought to life at Osterley Park. It's the site of their official training school, where a motley collection of artists, spies and war revolutionaries came together to set up the real Dad's Army. Tactics such as stealth were practiced. Here, one volunteer is trying to steal a bunch of keys without being heard. He is overheard, but the younger generation has more success. Oh, well done. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to have a go? So which other skills were taught? How to find weapons and things to fight the enemy with in your own homes. Um, tactics of uh, patrolling, ambush, uh, anti-tank tactics. We've been teaching some of the home guarders uh, how to shoot down aeroplanes, which I believe you, you, you saw earlier on. Uh, all sorts of different things, which hopefully they'll then be able to go back to their own Home Guard and LDV units and teach them and give them some, just some inspiration, really, that it is possible for ordinary people like us to unite to fight uh, against Hitler and against fascists. Although the shooting down of planes had a poor strike record, those that did come down were carefully customised. The event at Osterley recreated the feel of the times, with costumes, cars and a chance to relive the year of 1940. This year, excavations took place at the site to see what might still be here 70 years on. For the first time, Osterley Park is hosting the Digging Dad's Army project, a chance to rediscover the original building foundations of the training school here, as well as any objects the Home Guard may have left behind. The team hopes it will bring this piece of history to life. Where else do you get the British... The patriotic middle-class Brit, the Captain Mannerings and the Sergeant Wilsons and, and the Corporal Joneses being trained by um, you know, communist veterans from the Spanish Civil War, Baden Powell's uh, scout movement head of field craft, a surrealist painter and a Russian spy. I mean, you, know, you just can't make it up. Also, in terms of the modern British forces, it's the right there at the beginning of modern military training. It's when the initiative of a soldier using field craft to you know, um, do what you want to the enemy and then escape to fight another day at a, an individual level, at a squad level, at a platoon level, really comes into its own. A serving bomb disposal officer was also on site in case Second World War explosives were found and it seems they may have struck lucky. What we have here is a modified piece of military equipment that has been modified most probably to conduct electricity Metal screw picket. which could be used in a device in a location where we know they were using devices. There. It's about as good as it gets without actually having a label on it. It's just one of the memories of that remarkable time and of the men who were prepared to lay down their lives for their country on the home front. Victoria Smith, Forces News, Middlesex. Well, from the home front to the front lawn here outside the studios, because I'm joined by two men here who know rather a lot on this subject. They are Richard Hunt and Ralph Harvey, who are from the 23rd Sussex Home Guard. Well, tell me why it's so important. The Home Guard represents a spirit of self-sacrifice that is sorely lacking in the um, Britain today, I think. Yeah. Uh, you go, so you go around keeping the, the memory alive, you don't keep you? keep the memory alive. It was prompted by the Dad's Army series, and, and that kept it in the public eye, and, and we're trying to keep it there. Uh, Ralph, um... Now, who do you look like, I wonder? <laughs> well, let's put it this way. I've been playing Captain Mannering since 1993, uh, which is quite a long time. Mm. And earlier today, you did a, a little bit of a reenactment on our law, which probably surprised the people who work here. But let's see, see you in action, shall we? Right, well, well, if so I did that, madam, it's probably the going to say into the realms of fantasy. Stand to. Uh, you are in the realms of fancy, but you're here and you're real right now. Um, uh, just tell me a little bit about the kind of stuff you use, because we, we've got plenty of it here today, and you've been showing us around it. Where do you get it all from, and what is it exactly? Um, that's the boys' anti-tank rifle. He's the star of our show. And uh, 
which goes right down to the Home Guard Pike. Mm. And, and where do you actually go around getting it from exactly? Um, it's very difficult to get it at all now. But it's um, we go to military affairs and uh, we've got a lot of contacts in the business. Mm. And, uh, people tend to sort of put us in the direction of good stuff. Tell me about the, the family connection with the Home Guard because you do have a very strong one, don't well, you? Well, my father was a sergeant. First of all, he joined the local defence volunteers, mm. which was nicknamed as I am Look, Duck and Vanish. Mm -hmm. And they became, in, and in July 1940, they became a, the Home Guard. He became a sergeant in the Home Guard. Mm. And one of their first things they did was to go around all the fairgrounds and confiscate all the 2 2 rifles which, from the fairground people, give them a receipt because they were told they were paid after the war. Mm. But they ever were, I never knew. Mm. You said Look, Duck and vanish. Um, this kind of image of, of shambolic kind of behaviour of the Home Guard, is it fair? Because I mean, that's what kind of Dad's Army uses, isn't it? Is it's um, material. I, I personally, I found a lot of people, ex -first, first World War veterans, you had people who were accustomed to the countryside, uh, poachers, gamekeepers. There was a lot of people there who very quickly adapted to mm. using guns. Mm. So, no, I think they would have uh, given a good show if the hand mm. had come. Mm. But um, they would have been outgunned eventually. Mm. Oh, and what kind of reaction do you get when you're going around the country doing these demonstrations of people? Love the Home Guard. Yeah. They just love it. We still meet quite a few of the original guys. There's, there's some what do they say there. to you? Well, you get a total different reaction from different blokes from different units. Some of them say, I hate Dad's Army. It, it makes us look like a bunch of amateurs. And another one will come along and say, I love Dad's Army. We're just like that. Mm. And when you think, it's like, at any given time, the, the strongest uh, the Home Guard was, it was nearly two million men. So you've got the whole kaleidoscope, really, mm. of, of all sorts of people. Mm. The image that Dad's Army gives of it being make-do with um, pots of pepper and, and knives lashed to broom handles, it's an image that only lasted for a very short time, mm. probably no more than a couple of weeks, until mm. they started getting equipped by... You know, 1942, 43, they were a force to be reckoned with. Mm. There were a lot of trained men, a lot of younger men. There was stiffening of First World War veterans, but there was a lot of the men who were of a fighting age were in reserved occupations. Mm. Yeah, a lot of the older chaps had, had gone because they were too old to carry Listen, on. Listen, guys, you do a good job. I'm looking forward to seeing you in action myself one time. Thank you very much for coming to our lawn today and, and surprising everybody who works here. And you've brightened up our day. Let